Today I'm going to share with you my insights, methods, and drills for baseball and softball timing. I'll discuss three aspects of timing. One, mechanical timing, the length of our movements in time and distance measures from low to foot strike, and our subconscious memory of how long it takes to swing from point A to point B. Two, gather load, or timing the pitcher, or when we initiate the stride load. Three, precision timing, when to swing at a pitched ball based on contact point and pitch velocity. My passion for teaching timing derived from my frustrations of listening to other coaches, parents, and swing trainers instructing their hitters to swing sooner or swing later when they hit her with later early. Without having a reference for when they swung to begin with, this advice is useless to a hitter. One day in the year 2000, I was taking a break from working on my cages, taking some swings off the pitching machine. For some reason, I just couldn't find my timing. I was late and kept swinging and missing. I stepped out of the box, breathed, and watched a few pitches go by. Earlier, I had been hanging some tarps for batter's eyes in the separate cages so my hitters wouldn't be distracted by the person in the adjoining cage. An unhung tarp was lying on the ground in my cage, and just by chance, it was in the perfect place. As I breathed and watched the balls cross the tarp on their way to hitting the backstop, I realized that the ball crossed the edge of the tarp. That was the point my swing should have been started. I stepped back into the box, widened my gaze, and now I could see the ball as well as the ground and the tarp, and I started hitting again. This time, my swing was going as the ball crossed the edge of the tarp. My timing was back. I was hitting every ball solidly, and this was my timing. Measuring swing time adjustments off of a reference point and a feel of a certain distance, both visual and physical, to make late and early adjustments from. I then ran back to my desk and wrote out the algorithm that would eventually be the core of my training drills as well as the X-Factor hitting system. Okay, so I'm going to quickly hand over my, my duties as host to Stacy, and she'll be able to let people in that are in the waiting room and I will continue on with our presentation. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly show you, just for fun, the, um, here's my algorithm for timing that I wrote out back in 2000 that I eventually use in my X-Factor hitting system, but it was also what I used to create my um, timing drills. So we're gonna go on and discuss the timeline of a pitched ball and uh, this has a voiceover on it as well. And then I'm going to use a still frame to discuss um, a little bit more in detail some of that. And I'm gonna ask you to uh, unmute at that time and get some of your questions if there are, is anything that's not clear on this. So we'll begin with this video here. Here I'm going to provide you with uh, the timeline of uh, the release of the pitch to collision with the bat. And I'm going to go over the hitter metrics and how they fit in within that timeline structure. I'm going to use a pitch delivered at 90 miles per hour, traveling at an average velocity of 85.42 miles per hour over 55 feet. 55 feet is the distance between the release of the pitch and the point of contact or where the bat and ball are going to meet. It's going to take the ball 439 milliseconds to travel from the release point to the point of contact or the collision point. Now that we have the pitch set up, we'll go over the hitter metrics. And um, I chose the average Major League Baseball player's swing time and uh, reaction time. I'll discuss uh, the reaction time in a bit um, because there's a, a bit of a caveat involved. Um, simply because the hitter decides to swing if they have any uh, a hitch or or any negative movements then that would also be included which is why i call it a swing delay in this case i'm just using a pretty direct swing so um, i'm using average times for uh, for reaction time and for swing time in this scenario first is the hitter's overall swing time which is a combination of their mechanical swing 
and their reaction time or swing delay, uh, launch quickness in, in some of Dick's definitions or um, Vizio motor delay. So that would be 350 milliseconds or 0.35 seconds from decision to swing to collision with the ball. So once the hitter decides to swing, the first thing that occurs is the Vizio motor delay, also known as reaction time, or as I call it, the swing delay. In this case, the swing delay is 200 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds. Now we have the mechanical swing time, which is the motion component of the bat going from launch to contact, which is 150 milliseconds in this scenario. So once the hitter has identified the pitch and decided to swing, there's the reaction time of 200 milliseconds, then the mechanical swing time of 150 milliseconds. So this equals an overall swing time of 350 milliseconds or 0.35 seconds. The ball has now traveled about 13 feet from release point. It is 43.85 feet from the collision point. Here, the hitter makes their swing decision. They've identified the pitch, predicted where it's going to arrive and when it's going to arrive, and they've decided to swing. This is where the hitter's reaction time comes into play. Their body has not yet responded to the message from their brain to start swinging. During this delay, while the body is waiting to respond, the pitch prediction is refined and small changes can be applied. Generally, this is limited to stopping your swing this would appear as a twitch or a check swing. Now the message from the brain to the body arrives and the hitter begins his swing. Here the ball is 18.79 feet away or 150 milliseconds from contact. Once the swing starts, there's virtually nothing you can do to change the outcome. With only 150 milliseconds left before the ball arrives at the collision point, there simply isn't enough time left for you to send a message to your body to change anything. Not to mention when the ball is about 15 feet away, your eyes can't even process the ball anymore. You can't actually even see it. Um, I'm gonna go over this timeline in a bit more detail. Um, one of the things I didn't bring up was that it takes um, 100 milliseconds or 0.1 seconds just for our brains to identify the object that we're seeing, the ball. Um, and then the rest of the timeline is pretty clear. Something I wanted to also mention is I, I described the pitch as an average velocity. And the reason for that is that a lot of people get confused by this. You know, they'll see a 94 mile an hour pitch. Um, but the 94 mile an hour pitch arrives at the plate something at about 86 or something. I can do the math for you if you really wanted to. But um, it, it is losing, well actually a lot less than 86, but it's actually losing speed. You know, it's not, it's not self-propelled. It doesn't have a motor. And so the pitch is actually slowing down. So I use a lot of average speed when I talk about this. It's losing about a foot or a mile per hour every seven feet that it travels. So when we look at 94 mile hour pitches and things like that, and start, you know, I see a lot of people on Twitter will talk about, you know, how long these pitches take to get there, and they're really inaccurate because they're they're under the assumption that the, the ball is an automobile that's traveling, you know, at the same speed the entire flight path, and, and it definitely is not. Um, we talk about reaction time. Uh, which is our visual visual motor delay. Um, we we are we, we don't even perceive our reaction time. So if, if those of you who are, are with us now um, were to reach for an object, just look at an object and reach for it, uh, you don't recognize the delay. But there's actually uh, on average 200 to 250 milliseconds of delay before we actually respond and start going after the object that we're reaching for. The reason why we have the, the visual motor delay is so that we don't, we're not actually able to, to respond with not enough information. So uh, particularly when we're, we're intersecting with another moving object, we want as much information as possible. So what's happening is we've sent the message to our body, but then our brain delays that message and we continue to gather data. We continue to, to look at uh, different motion cues, how it's traveling through space and things like that before our body actually responds. And, and hitting a pitched ball is looked at as uh, in three segments, um, which would be the first would be identify the pitch. The second segment is it's travel along that flight path before it gets to that time of contact that we're seeing here, where it says motor attack. 
In that second stage, we're refining our decision and we can actually make little adjustments. Um, we're seeing that the ball might be moving down more than we thought it was. Um, some hitters make uh, make their, their, their decision early and, and that's it. They just start swinging and they don't really allow themselves to process. You'll see these guys are called selling out on swings. Um, we see a great deal of that today in, in today's game. And we can talk about that and why um, a bit later. When we get to the point of, of time of contact or time to contact, that's that 150 milliseconds that's equal to our 100 millis 150 millisecond swing time. And at this point, we uh, this is the third segment of the pitch flight path. Um, we actually cannot see the ball any longer. We can't um, keep up with it. our brain. What it does for us is it creates a seamless picture that in retrospect, when we, when we think about it later, um, we, we, a lot of hitters will say, oh, well, I saw the ball hit my bat. Well, that's absolutely virtually impossible. You've seen, and again, this is, this is reviewing what, what your brain has created for you. Um, what you've seen is a seamless image of what your brain assumed would happen based on all of the cues that it picked up along that, that flight path. Um, we do not see blur and we don't process blur because it's, it's a waste of time for us. It, it doesn't offer us any information that's usable. And so our brain completely rejects blur. So if I move my eyes back and forth, um, turn my head while I was looking at something, I wouldn't see it blur the same way I would had I used the camera and moved the camera back and forth. You'd see a great deal of blur. Um, and so our brain just rejects those images and then puts together, fills in all these little gaps um, with information so that we feel like we saw the whole event happen when we actually didn't. Um, I do a great deal of training with hitters that um, are able to do this, um, closing their eyes as they're swinging. And again, there's going to be a bit of a, a delay with that too. So I'll say, close your eyes the moment you feel your swing moving. And what that does for my hitter is most of us tend to, as we, what we talked about last week um, in, in the upper body conversation, what we, uh, what we do is we see the ball as an object of resistance. And so we try to produce tight muscle strength, what we perceive as strength, um, to fight with the object of resistance. And it, it's, it's similar to martial arts when we, um, we're breaking boards and we want to focus eight inches on the other side of that board. And so um, if I focus only on the board itself, I produce enough force to hit the board and I end up hurting my hand and the board doesn't break. But if I were to focus beyond that board, I could break through the board and reach out to the area that I was aiming for. Um, so the same thing happens with my hitters when I have guys that are really tight. They aren't actually tight when they get to the ball. They're actually slightly tight before they get to the ball. They start tightening and they'll cut off their swings. They'll lose extension. Um, you'll see their chest and heads pulling off the ball. And that's just from using muscles at a time where we should have relaxed and allowed the bat to carry through. Um, the bat is, is we, we have created um, a, a pull for the bat. And so the bat is now moving. And the fact that it has weight on the end, as it starts to circle around its arc, it's actually swinging sort of by itself. Had we thrown it, it would helicopter rather than fly in a straight line as we discussed last week. So that's a bit more information on our timeline for us. Peter Fatty is here. Hey, Peter. Um, Peter is very familiar with the three segments of, of hey there, uh, the three segments of that, that pitch timeline that we discussed. Um, Peter's, Peter's uh, field of interest is very much in that area of pre-release and release of the ball. So if you, if you want to add some things to that discussion, please feel free. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Well, I, I would say release in first third, you know, right. to, to take right. and, it, and it really goes right with your timeline and your model for sure. You know, you're, you're not seeing everything you know about that pitch. I, I think a, 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 an experienced hitter's eyes pretty much kind of naturally make kind of a zip line of that pitch coming in. And if you pick up any of those early advanced cues, you may not know what they what they are yet, but they they may make an adjustment in that straight line in. And so, you know, ability hitters with enough of a mental database are able to um, kind of make that adjustment, kind of swing where they uh, where their imagination. You know, like Dusty Baker in his book said, you hit the slider with your imagination, 
And right. that says a lot. Yeah. And that's one of those books that's written like it's written for kids, but really you could use it at any level. Right, absolutely. Um, and I, it, Tony Gwynn was very similar in his um, instruction. Uh, it, it was very much fit for kids. So sometimes we take a lot of this for rote and we end up, uh, well, Tony Gwynn said, take your knob to the ball, and clearly the knob is not actually going to the ball. So, but, but it's a good cue. It, it helps the hitter not lead with the barrel and start to make this turn and it helps them with their hands. Um, Peter does, <clears throat> does a lot of work with uh, what's called video occlusion, which is when he talked about being interested in that first third of ball travel, um, what he does is he blacks out the video at that moment and the hitter then uses the information that they had gathered in that first third and uh, attempts to predict what that pitch was. Um, is that accurate, Peter? There it is. You're, you're muted right now. You'll have to unmute yourself. You'll see a pitch, and then you've got to kind of guess the, um, I'll get another one. You see like a, a, you see like a third of the pitch. Boom, that like, cuts off. And then you're guessing, you know, ball, strike, slider. That stuff doesn't necessarily matter. But then when you see the replay, like it's, then you get the little wider view and you get the shape of the pitch. So the idea right. is that your eyes kind of learn to say, okay, out of hand, at the plate, out of hand, at the plate with lots and lots of reps. You know, it's, it's really kind of dog training for your, your eyes, brains. Right. You know, well, and hopefully you tie it into the hands, but that's where you really need the instructor like yourself putting those things together. Because if you don't have that last part where you've got, you know, I see brain makes the adjustment and you've got the swing that goes with it, that's fired, you know, the script, it, it's not gonna matter. Well, you know, interesting you say that when, when you talked about the hands, um, I, I don't teach anybody's hands to go anywhere because I have yet to have met a person that didn't have some type of disability brain damage or something like that, that actually couldn't reach for an object and grab it. And so this is something that gets very complicated. And you start getting really cue oriented on talking about hands when I refer back to that two-year-old kid that I put up there all the time. And his hands go exactly where his eyes are directing him and he doesn't think about it. Um, one of, I brought Peter into this just now because I was talking about where I occlude, um, and that is where the area where I know we're not seeing the ball any longer anyway. And I've, I've had hitters do this in games. I've had hitters do this, um, professionals do this in games, hitting against guys who do 97. Um, and, and, and this would be something I would do with them when they had too much tension in their swings. I'd say, you really have to let go and, okay, close your eyes. And it, it actually works because I already knew that that you, they weren't seeing the ball anyway. Um, it's a dangerous thing to do with some hitters because they uh, they don't time it very well. They think, okay, swing, close their eyes, and they start to swing, and then they're, they're done because they're not actually looking at the ball in the areas that they should be in that second, third. Um, okay, so thank you, Peter, for that. And uh, we'll probably call back on you again to get, you, get, get some opinion from you. Um, I'm gonna go back, and if I don't have any more questions, I'm gonna continue on and um, show some more videos and do some other discussions on various other aspects like uh, like we talked about um, mechanical timing.